Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here, of course, right? As everybody, hopefully. So I'd like to talk about common misconceptions in autonomous driving, which I think is something that we should discuss as a community. So I want to bring some, shed some light onto, onto some of the things that we discovered recently that I think are important. So this is the team, Kashyap, Daniel, Marcel, and Bernhard. They all look quite happy on these pictures, right? Almost too happy. Um, for those of you who work in self-driving, I guess most of you do, you know that maybe this is not an accurate reflection of the emotional state of a self-driving researcher. So maybe that's a more, more appropriate uh, um, reflection of, of the emotional state. Uh, reflecting in particular frustration. Oh, I'm not sure if this comes across well. Um, so frustration about what? Frustration about not being able to produce, reproduce research results in end-to-end -end driving because it's extremely hard. Even if code is made available, it sometimes happens that we are submitting to the leaderboard and achieve only 50% of the score that is reported originally by the method with apparently the same code. Um, frustration also about the training variance. You train a model um, and then you evaluate it, right? Evaluation takes very long, so it is a very long process. And you train it with a different seed and you get completely different evaluation score, which means in order to get statistically significant results, you need to train multiple times and evaluate multiple times in a complex simulator, your entire system. And not all papers do that, of course, because it, it's just an enormous amount of time and resources. And then finally, uh, one thing I think that concerns the computer vision community in general, but also like this community here in particular, and we are as guilty as everybody else. I feel sometimes when reading papers, like the, 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 the key points that are highlighted as the story that are sold to the reviewers, are not what make these methods tick well on the leaderboards, right? There is other things that are maybe mentioned in the supplementary, like a different data set, data set size, training schedule, little tricks and hacks to the architecture that are not as beautiful to describe and sell to the reviewers, but that really are responsible for the majority of the performance improvement. So what I think we need is to have a more sober look at look at the at the you know at what makes methods work and try to start from from the basics. Try to start with simple models. Try to um, analyze why things work and why not. And that's like what we tried. And I'd like to present two projects along those lines. The first project is on new plan. Um, it's called Parting with Misconceptions about Learning Based Vehicle Motion Planning. It's uh, uh, recently uh, sent to archive so you find it there and new plan is, is a great simulator it's fantastic that we have the simulator now because it allows us to benchmark on real world um, planning and a real world planning challenge and as a matter of fact the method that we have submitted to this year's new plan challenge won that particular challenge right this is not the main focus of this talk i want to talk about the underlying principles that led to this discovery of a very simple algorithm that won the new plan challenge. I just wanted to mention this um, as this is going to be presented in, in another workshop today. So new plan is great. This is something that the community has been um, awaiting for, for a long time, actually. <laughs> um, so 1,500 hours of driving logs from Vegas, Pittsburgh, Singapore, Boston, very diverse. It's a data driven simulator. It's real, right? It's not it's not like Carla, it's real data simulation based on real world logs. It, has, it uses an auto labeled environment where a heavy offline perception stack is run offline um, to generate the environment, um, to label the environment. And this is given to the planner as an input. So this is what it looks like. This is a bird's eye view. Um, and this is uh, what the simulation looks like. So this is great. Now we can work with, we, we can try to explore planning on these real world scenarios, very diverse, large scale. And there's two metrics that are evaluated in new plan. One is the open loop metric and one is the closed uh, loop metric. Open loop means 
basically what we call also ego forecasting. You try to predict where your vehicle should be in the next eight seconds by comparing your prediction uh, to the ground truth, to where the actual human driver was driving. And there's various uh, submetrics like the miss rate and the final displacement error, roughly a higher horizon of eight seconds into the future. And then there is closed loop uh, planning where um, a linear quadratic regulator as a controller in combination with a bicycle model is used to actually plan out, um, you know, to actually control the vehicle um, for a certain duration. Um, and then you can, of course, use closed loop metrics uh, that are so important, like collision, uh, driving direction, comfort, uh, time to collision, etc. So these two are both used to, to benchmark methods on the new plan challenge. Okay, so let's look into methods. And as I said, we want to start very simple. So the simplest thing we can do for a um, learning-based forecasting uh, pipeline is probably a combination of a very simple um, lateral, um, a, a lateral path selector, as well as a, a learning-based um, you know, trajectory generator. So what we do here, and we call this PDM open, it's called PDM open because we call it a, a predictive driving model, and this is for the open loop um, simulation primarily. So we, we take the HD map, which is given, um, and then we do a graph search using Dijkstra to extract a, a lane graph based on where we want to go. This is provided by the task description. And then um, we have a simple two layer, two layer, two hidden layer MLP that takes this center line that I've just shown, as well as the ego history, like the position in the past, a velocity acceleration, puts this into a simple two layer MLP and outputs the waypoints of the future trajectory, right? So very simple model, very small model, forecasting eight seconds into the future, trained to imitate the expert trajectory. Okay, so how well does this model do? Well, it turns out this outperforms the state of the art. Um, so here you can see some baseline methods, for example, urban driver, GCPGP, plan CNC. These are much more complex models that use as input information called context here, not only the ego history and the route, but also the map, the entire HD map is consumed, as well as um, you know, all the agents um, around the vehicle. And they use sophisticated representations like polygons or graphs and use graph neural networks and such. Um, so in contrast here, we have a two layer MLP that works on a point based representation and uses only the ego history and this route from the Dijkstra algorithm as an input to predict the, um, like the, uh, the ego trajectory. And this gives like the best, in comparison, the best open loop performance here. So what this means is really like the route center line is all you need for ego forecasting. Now, unfortunately, most of the previous papers did not consider such a simple baseline. That's, you know, maybe because it surprisingly works well, right? So this is something that really should be considered. Try to use simple baselines. Um, then we went on and thought about, you know, an alternative to that, a rule-based alternative, right? In previous days, people worked with rule-based models. So we use a very simple one here, 20 years old. Lateral control is the same as before, Dijkstra on the, on the, on the HD map. And we use a longitudinal controller it's called the intelligent driver model. It's basically just a simple you know, ODE that has an analytical solution that uh, controls the speed of your vehicle based on what's in front of you, right? So it tries to adapt the speed such that, you know, um, you're not colliding with the vehicle in front of in, in the path in front of you, right? Has some tunable parameters for maximum speed, acceleration, distance, etc. But very simple model, 20 years old. Now, it turns out if we apply this on um, the new plan subset that we use for validation, um, we we do not get good open loop performance, and this is already hinting to another misconception, which is that open loop performance is not indicative for closed loop driving. There was some prior work that also mentioned this, um, but but here we really have a negative. We have measured negative correlation. Um, so the open loop performance goes down, but the closed loop performance is actually quite good. It's better than again better than the learned planners. So in this case, a, a simple rule based. Um, a planner baseline beats all the learned planners in this closed loop driving task, right? However, in prior work, often 
like learned planners are only compared to learned planners and not to rule-based planners, right? So this experiment is not available. Now, um, what I already alluded to is that like improving one metric makes the other worse. And this is another instantiation of this. So what we did here is we, we took two different methods, PDM open and the simple IDM model. Right? PDM open was the one with the MLP and IDM was the, uh, the simple um, following model and changed some of their hyperparameters, two different variants. And what you can see is that if you change the hyperparameter, there's always one metric getting better and the other metric getting worse, right? Higher is better here, by the way, this is numbers between zero and 100, 100 is the best. Um, so this means that the planning and the ego forecasting tasks are fundamentally misaligned, right? And that's important to know because the motivation for many learning based um, planning methods is to actually eventually improve self-driving performance in, in closed loop simulation, but it seems that this is actually not true, right? So you need to be very careful with um, making statements about self-driving performance when you only measure open loop performance. <clears throat> okay, now, of course, this IDM model is very simple, right? So um, I'm not arguing that you should consider other vehicles as well, right? It's clear if there's vehicles driving around you, then these give you a benefit, right? If you predict those, and that's what we do. We extend the IDM model to what we call PDM closed. It's a simple extension of the IDM model um, with concepts of model predictive control, but very sim simple. So I walk you through. So again, we do the center line um, extraction as before. Um, what we then do is we we have the other agents, right? This is input. This, the perception stack is given, right? We don't um, consider perception in this. This is all input. Um, so we forecast the agents with a constant velocity and heading angle model. And then we generate proposals by combining three lateral center lines and running this IDM um, controller um, with, uh, well, this, this IDM um, quadratic regulator controller are based on the IDM model with five different target speed hyperparameters. So we get 15 different proposals. And uh, so then we score these proposals and we use a very simple heuristic, a very simple function for scoring those, which is, um, well, evaluating things that are also evaluated by the new plan challenge. So we want to maximally align this, of course, right? So we want to reach the goal. We want to not deviate from the path. We want to basically uh, not, not crash into other vehicles, et cetera. So this is all considered in this, in this scoring. And then we simply select the highest scoring proposal. Okay, well, this is what we call PDM closed. And so what we see is now that the performance compared to IDM, the closed loop performance significantly increases from 77 to 92, right? But there's only little improvements in the open loop performance and it doesn't by far reach the performance of PDM open, the simple two layer MLP, right? Which was 86, now we had 44. But 92 closed loop performance is quite good. It's the best closed loop performance of all the methods, of all the 30 methods that have been submitted this year to the new plan challenge with a significant margin. Um, and it's a simple model, right? Um, so uh, here are some results of what this looks like. We have on the left, we have the PDM close. Actually, it's a bit confusing because it does a lane change here. But what you can see is you have a high initial displacement, but you get closed loop stability. So the vehicle follows well. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the PDM open, we get a very good prediction at the beginning, but then the vehicle veers off because you have out of distribution data and it, uh, it basically slowly recovers, but then it steers on the other side of the road. So you get closed loop failures here. Right. So, well, the obvious thing now is, well, a single model doesn't do the trick, right? If we want to win the new plan challenge, we need to combine two models at least, right? One that's good for open loop, one that's good for closed loop, right? So maybe it doesn't even make sense to evaluate both in the same metric, but that's what new plan does. So we, we play with these rules, of course. Um, so that's what we try to do. Um, so we build a hybrid planner where sh the short term trajectory is, is, is done by a rule based planner, PDM closed, and the long term correction with a learned ego forecasting model called a PDM offset, and it's slightly different to the previous one. So what PDM offset does is it consumes the PDM closed trajectory, the green points here, and then it only predicts the delta, which is then the like added to the green points, these are the purple points. And then what we do is for the horizon of two seconds, we, um, we remove back the deltas, right? So we get the output of the PDM closed controller because this is 
uh, of the PDM closed model because this is important for the for the closed loop controller. Closed loop controller only considers the immediate uh, two seconds ahead of you, but the next eight seconds are important for the open loop evaluation, right? So we we keep the purple points for second two to second eight. So this is what the entire thing looks like. Um, it's very simple, right? So the um, map goes in, uh, the route goes in, um, then the PDM closed result goes in as the trajectory in green, and then all goes through this very simple MLP to predict the deltas. And then we just remove all the deltas from the first two seconds. And you get this weird trajectory on the right. Doesn't make much sense, but it wins the new plan challenge. Okay, um, so this is what it does. You get good open loop performance, you get good closed loop performance, right? Because of this, um, discrepancy between open loop and closed loop. So you have these two elements now in your trajectory. So you have strong ego forecasting for eight seconds, but you also have strong planning performance for the next two seconds for your controller. Um, yes. <clears throat> so um, what you see here on the right is what we varied on the x-axis is the, the, the parameter C, which is basically when we switch from closed loop to open loop. And as you can see, if we, you know, um, use mostly open loop planning, right, then the closed loop performance is very bad at 0 0.5. If we um, push that threshold to free, then the, the open loop performance degrades because you're, you're using, um, but the closed loop performance also doesn't decrease because it doesn't take advantage of, of, of three seconds, two or 1.5 seconds are enough, right? So what that means is that learned or long-term forecasting really doesn't help in closed loop driving, at least in the new plan challenge, right? The only thing that matters is the next two seconds and you don't need to do any sophisticated long term planning for that. It's more reactive driving. So this is the result here of the IDM model. You can see it, 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 it follows uh, the road well, but it in the first frame, it doesn't predict the, the eight seconds into the future very well. Then the PDM open, I uh, need to wait until resets. Uh, it predicts well in the beginning, but it veers off and it, it drives through our vehicles and so on. And then here we have the hybrid um, model. Okay, we need to wait again until it jumps back to the beginning, um, which is kind of the best of both worlds. So it does both like, uh, it predicts well eight seconds into the future, but it also um, gives the controller the right inputs to steer well. Here's another example on a highway scenario where you can also see, for example, PDM open, right? Doesn't behave well while the others uh, do well in the um, closed loop simulation. Okay, so um, now let's switch gears a little bit and uh, let's look at Kala, right? We also, of course, we all love Kala, right? We work on Kala for a long time. And uh, we also wanted to uncover some of the mysteries that we currently observe in um, the numbers reported on Kala. Um, and so we call this paper the hidden biases of end-to-end -end autonomous driving. It's also, we've put it on Archive recently. So Kala is different from new plan, right? It's, it's fundamentally different and there's a, there's a huge value in having, these bo having both of these benchmarks, right? So in contrast to new plan in Kala, we have not a, a very limited simulation time frame, but we have an unlimited one, uh, right? We can simulate as long as we want, but instead of data-driven scenarios, we now have handcrafted scenarios. On the other hand, we also have perception, right? Models are, all, are just getting the, the RGB image or the LIDARs input, so you'd have to also solve the perception problem. In Kala, this is the situation. Um, so on the x-axis are the years, and on the y-axis is the driving score from zero to 100. This is Kala 1.0. In Kala 2.0, nobody has achieved anything so far. Um, so this is Kala 1.0. And you can see there's a steady increase for end-to-end -end driving models, but modular pipelines don't perform or didn't achieve a, a good performance. Now, what we were wondering is like, well, given this, this dramatic progress in end-to-end -end driving on Kala, what actually happened to the compounding error problem? What is the compounding error problem? So, so most of the methods that work well on Kala are imitation learning, right? And so in imitation learning, you have the fundamental problem of compounding errors, which is if you're, if you're driving, um, you're trying to, at, at training time, you're trying to imitate the expert, right? So you're in distribution, but then as soon as you're driving, you're getting outside the distribution, 
and then you're getting like you're, you're steering off the road typically because you're increasing your error. Your model doesn't know what to do and the errors increase and increase. So the error is compounding. This is the red curve here, right? Um, where we leave the, the uh, in distribution um, domain. Now, the interesting thing is, it seems like the methods that work well on Kala have solved this problem. And the question is why? So for example, here, transfuser 2022, on the longest six benchmark, which has 1.5 kilometer long, route, long routes, where you know these problems should definitely occur, it's long enough. Um, we have almost zero route deviation, which means vehicles don't go off road. And these models don't use data augmentation. They don't do stagger. They are just like trained in a naive behavior cloning manner. So where did the compounding error problem go? So we tried to understand this better. We tried to ask ourselves, what do models predict outside the training distribution? And for that, we looked at a couple of different, these are different models, TCP, LAV, transfuser, and we forcefully intervened. We forcefully steered into the wrong direction and looked what the model predicted. Now, all of these models are predicting waypoints. It's much easier to predict waypoints compared to, um, you know, uh, acceleration and steering. That's well known. Um, so they predict waypoints and have a little controller that follows the waypoints. And in contrast to previous years where you had like a conditional command that just told you at the next intersection, go left, right or straight. Now, Kala provides also a target point that comes every 50 or 10 meters. Well, it depends a bit on this uh, on, on the map um, and you, sh you you must pass this target point. this gives you basically information where to turn uh, at the next intersection and which lane you should be driving on and what we observed is that all of these models no matter how we interfere they steer back to the target point which is what they should do right but we haven't trained them to do so so that's weird Yes, so let's look a bit at the architecture. So this is just one example. This is Transfuser um, from our group, um, but the others are, you know, similar. Um, they are all different, but yeah, the, the fundamental concepts of the output representation are similar. So we have here, we have a LiDAR and an RGB image as input. We have an input branch, and then we create a spatial map, eight by eight in this case. We do average pooling, and then we have a GRU a gated recurrent unit, a recurrent decoder for the waypoints that also gets the goal location as an input. Right, so this is the spatial pooling and this is the goal location and this is the GRU decoder. And at the same time, we have some auxiliary losses, both in the bird's eye view space and in the image space to give the model uh, a better training signal so it trains more stably, it generalizes better. This is all what, what is well known, what people have shown, not, not just us. Okay, so what we compare here first is like the performance of using a navigational command left, right, straight versus this target point. And it was impossible for us in no circumstance to reproduce the performance of the target point with any model using a navigational command as input. This means that it's, it's definitely much easier to use the target point. That makes some sense, right? But why? So what we discovered is that basically the target point condition models learn a shortcut right we know that neural networks are good at shortcut learning they try to find the easy way out they learn a shortcut to extrapolate their waypoints towards the nearest target point when in out of distribution mode and this makes also sense right because this grew at every recurrent step of its processing time receives the goal location as an input so there's a very direct pathway from the goal location to the waypoints that it generates. And what this model effectively does is in many relevant situations, ignoring the input completely. It doesn't ignore it always, of course, right? If, it, if the situation is clear, it uses the input. It's important to use the input, but it ignores the input more frequently than we want it to. So here's an example. So here we have a, a, a situation which is not unsolvable. It's, it's, you know, it's at night, uh, it's challenging, but it's not unsolvable. And what um, what we have here is basically the target point that's far away, 20, 30 meters away in red. Uh, these are two different scenarios. So let's look at the left one first. And so what we can see is that the, this model, like this, this shortcut learning, leads to the fact that in this case, we cut the corner, right? We drive on the opposing side of the lane. We, we even drive off-road. Um, the waypoints are completely wrong, right? 
But the interesting thing here is that the semantic segmentation, remember these models also produce semantic segmentation in bird's eye view, that's what they are trained for. The semantic segmentation is correct, right? Produces the wrong waypoints despite it knows where the road is. This means that the GRU completely ignores the input. And this is also true on the right hand side. So this is a shortcut that on average in expectation because we do empirical risk minimization um, reduces the error. But of course in driving it's important to always drive correctly also in those situations. So how can we solve this and actually we haven't solved this and what else has solved it but um, like they haven't talked too much about it in the paper that's why I want to highlight it again. Um, the solution to this is uh, called DETER. This is a method for object detection using a transformer that has been uh, has inspired interview a model called Interfuser. Um, and the idea is instead of global average pooling um, to uh, uh, have a attention based transformer decoder here in the red box that has learned queries one query per waypoint, but has an attention mechanism right so it, it keeps the spatial information. And then produces features per waypoint that then go into the GRU. And now the GRU has an easier time to attend to um, also the input. It doesn't learn to ignore the input anymore. And this is what happens. So here you can see that basically in both these situations now, um, the model um, doesn't you know, shortcut. It, it goes along the, um, the, the correct lane. And so we can also compare the global average pooling and the transformer decoder here. So left is the, the global pooling. And you can see if we manually change the target point that this model just follows the target point, while if we do this for the transformer decoder, it stays on the road. Okay, so this was, I think, a very important detail that hasn't been investigated uh, too much before. Yes, so the key insight here is that average pooling removes spatial information and increases the shortcut bias, right? And if we have the transformer decoder, we can reduce that bias and we get a better driving score and a better route completion. So finally, let's see while I'm in time. Oh, two minutes. Okay, <laughs> so no questions, but I will, uh, I will finish. Um, so, um, the, uh, the final thing I wanna talk about is the output representation. So we are using waypoints and this is what works best. Um, but waypoints, the thing is that waypoints are ambiguous, an ambiguous representation. So for example, here we have a green traffic light and we don't know if it will, will turn red. So if we just, you know, if we just make a point prediction, we can never do the right prediction because, you know, we always, you know, we want to predict a, a small velocity and a large velocity at the same time, right? And that's what the model learns to do with waypoints. Um, so what we try to do to understand this better is to disentangle the output representation. So instead of predicting a trajectory with the group, we predict, uh, we classify the target speed using a speed classifier, right? And what we can do then, first of all, we expose uncertainty now because we have a discrete distribution for the speed. And what we um, can do then is we can either take the arc max over the speed or we can take the weighted average, the weighted speed. And it turns out if we take the arc max, the, dr the driving score drops dramatically and if we take the weighted average, we get the same or even better perform a driving score performance than the original waypoint representation, right? So now also exposing uncertainty. So this means that waypoint representations work well as they learn to interpolate, right? And here's another example, but I'm hurrying up. So now we have a simple model with strong performance um, and there's more experiments in the paper. There's other things that are relevant like data augmentation, data set scaling, um, um, curriculum learning as well, and so on. I want to highlight that we um, no. I want to highlight uh, this. I want to summarize quickly these these uh, seven points that I wanted to uh, make here today. The first is a route center line is all you need for ego forecasting. Rule based beat learn planners in closed loop driving. The planning and ego forecasting tasks are fundamentally misaligned. Maybe one of the most important insights. Learned long term forecasting does not improve closed loop driving. Target point conditioned color methods perform shortcut learning. Average pooling removes spatial information and increases this shortcut bias and waypoint representations work well as they learn to interpolate. Um, we do have a survey on end to end autonomous driving models and that's going to be uploaded next week to archive It has 20 pages surveys 20, 250 papers. It's intended for newcomers and experts and tries to focus a bit on these challenges. So if you're interested in reading more. And all of our code is also available, so you can try out our models. We call this the new plan and the Carla garage. Thank you.